Thank you, Pastor, for allowing us to come, inviting us. And we look forward to today. It, it, this is something, obviously, that's on our heart, and our desire is to see churches reproducing churches. And so hopefully if you're here this morning, and then obviously the next service, and then hopefully you'll come back tonight. Really, there's nothing worth staying home for over tonight. Uh, you'll want to come back tonight because I'm going to show you not only historically from the Bible tonight, but also historically in America where uh, churches, reproducing more churches, actually impacted a certain region of America and we're still reaping that impact 250 some years later. And so you want to see that tonight. And it's a very, very eye-opening uh, illustration of what God can do through uh, churches that have a desire to plant more churches. We understand this is a church plant. And uh, how old are you? Two years? Two years, April. Two years in April. And uh, you might say, well, why even talk about planting more churches? We are a baby church ourselves. Well, my grandmother, very wise grandmother I have, she'll be 94 in April. Uh, she told me when I got married, she said, Now, Jeremy, if you wait till you're financially able to have kids, you probably never will. And she was absolutely right. Uh, you know, and so as much as we wanted to plan financially and so on, uh, the Lord uh, puts on the heart of a church should, even at, even at your age, just about two years old, God should be already putting on your hearts a desire to reach the world. And you're doing that through your missions program. You support missionaries and so on. But the Bible is very clear. You'll see that here in a moment. That it's not only across the seas. It's also other cities and towns nearby. And that is God's plan. If we, if we get this in place today, if you, get, if you don't get anything else, get this. God's plan is for churches not only to grow in their personal city, but also to reach the world. And we do that one city, one town at a time. And so let's ask God before we really jump in here to bless this day and specifically this Sunday school time. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that as we dig in and dive into uh, your truth this morning, that you would help us to get a burden for your desire. You came to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ died for the church. The institution, the ordination of the church, the organization, the living, breathing organism of the local church was put in place to reproduce and to have uh, an impact not only in the cities where we're at, but also nearby areas and all over the world. We pray now, teach us, help us to grow with you. Speak through me, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're starting here in Matthew 28. And this is a basic passage that we talk about, evangelism and so on. But I want to start here in the last part of Matthew 28. Uh, in verse 18, Jesus said, and I want us to remember a particular word here, but Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So remember that word power there for a moment, um, because it'll come up again later. The word power means enablement. It doesn't necessarily mean dynamite, although that's where we get our English word dynamite from. Uh, I am from Tennessee now. I, I'm not from there originally. I grew up in South Florida, was born on a farm in Indiana. And uh, we moved from Indiana to another northern state, Florida. Uh, Florida is full of Yankees. Uh, and, uh, and so all of my friends, you know, we were from Ohio and Michigan and all of that. It's kind of interesting because uh, the west coast of Florida is really a lot of uh, Midwesterners who moved down, uh, specifically because of the, uh, the blizzard of 78, drove, drove a lot of people down to Florida and all the snow and all that. Uh, but then on your side over here, you have I-95 that goes down to Florida. And on the uh, east coast of Florida, you have a lot more of uh, New Englanders, uh, and uh, Atlantic uh, uh, side people that, that migrate because of the interstate. 
So it's kind of interesting how Florida was made up. Uh, now uh, those lines are crossing, but uh, when I lived there and grew up there, that was kind of the way it was. Uh, but in Tennessee, where I live now, um, they call it Rocky Top for a reason. Uh, whenever you dig, uh, whether it's uh, near our house, and my, my wife loves to plant things, and, but you dig about 18 inches or 16 or 18 inches down, and you hit limestone. It is just hard. And unless you have a jackhammer or uh, a breaking bar or something, it's just very difficult to get through. So whenever they built roads in Tennessee, and I live just north of Nashville, about 20 miles, and when, and when you go through the interstates and some of the roads, uh, in order to, to get through that, they've had to use dynamite. They've had to blow it up. And, uh, and you, you, we hear of this often where they're putting a building in or they're flattening a a, a, a hilltop or whatever, and, and you know, it's more than just getting a bulldozer and a front end loader. Uh, often they have to blow the thing up. They've got to blow their, uh, you know, the top of a, a hill up or a ridge or whatever. And so that's where we get this word from, uh, the, the word power, but I want us to think of it as enablement. In other words, uh, in Nashville, we weren't able to make roads without it. And here, Jesus is saying, all power, that enablement that I'm about to explain to you, what that enablement is going to be able to do, all that power is given to me in heaven and in earth. So whatever Christ is going to teach us here, we are not able to do without Him. Amen. It's nothing that we can uh, budget necessarily it's not the it's nothing that we can actually plan for necessarily it has to be of the lord now obviously god's given us a bible and a brain right we should use both right we are accountable for how we use our abilities and our finances and all of that but i want us to understand that church planting is a movement of the lord it has to be of him uh, we get asked as a ministry often, where are the most needy cities in America? Can you, church planners will call or text or email, whatever, and ask, you know, where is the greatest need for church planning in America? And my response is always right in the middle of God's will. It's not necessarily, you know, Nashville is growing 80-some people a day. There's a tremendous need for church planning in downtown Nashville. Richmond, Virginia, same thing. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, same thing. Uh, Knoxville is even growing. There's a lot of churches there already, but there's a need. Uh, Alabama has 13 counties without churches that there's a need right now. Uh, you can go across the nation and look and say, boy, these cities and these areas, they need churches. But if we, if we aren't called of the Lord, if it's not a movement of the Lord, if we don't know that the Lord is in it, then it's destined to fail. I was listening to a presentation of a church planner recently, and he was going to Arizona. He was going to an area outside of Arizona, and it was a growing area. Lots of homes were being built. And part, most of his video that he was showing showed that this area was going to have so many homes built in a certain amount of time and, you know, uh, and all that. My question, and I know this church planner is doing a good job. He started since then and doing a good job. My question is, it, what's going to happen if all those homes aren't built? Are you still going to stay there? Because if we only go to an area because there's a lot of new homes, you know, whatever, uh, what if the economy tanks again? What if those homes go belly up? And what if nobody ever does move there? Are you going to stay there? Uh, is it of the Lord? By the way, uh, every church planner, if they're honest, has to review once in a while their calling. When things get a little bit tough, when things get a little bit uh, strenuous, and we often as church planners have to go back to uh, our calling. Has God called me here? Is this church first state? Is this of the Lord? Or was, just, or was this started out of some business meeting somewhere? No, it was of the Lord. Now, because it was of the Lord, obviously there was business meetings and there was finances available and there was all those things that had to come in after that. But we have to understand the power 
that Christ is going to give the local church to reach other areas, it has to be of Him. So, let's find out what He says here then. In verse 19, with this power, He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So, uh, the word go means to move in a positive direction. Um, It doesn't mean to go backwards. It means to gain ground. Uh, If you think of it in a military way, uh, you know, you may establish a a base of operations where you have uh, medical supplies and food and ammunition and and communications and so on. Uh, But when you're in a war, you don't just stop with that base, right? You have to, uh, at a certain time, reach a new area and go, in, go deeper into enemy territory and, and gain more ground. Well, that's what he's saying here to his disciples and ultimately the church. I don't want you just to stay right where you're at. I want you to gain ground. I want you to go. And it says here to teach all nations. Now, there are about 7,000, just over 7,000 different Uh, uh, languages and dialects of languages that need the Word of God in the world right now. Just over 7,000. Only 471 actually have the Bible. Just over 1,100 have the New Testament. So uh, there are a couple other hundred that have pieces of, you know, maybe the book of John or the book of Romans or the book of Matthew, whatever translated. But there are roughly 4,000 different languages still in the world, people groups that have their own language or strong dialect that would constitute a a different uh, Bible for them. Just over 4,000 in the world still that need the Word of God. Uh, And so what he is saying here hasn't been done since the early church age. Uh, But he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So there's a great mandate here. There's a lot of uh, ground to cover. There's a lot of uh, things to be done. But then it says to baptize them. So as you take the Word of God into new areas and new communities, people are going to be uh, saved. They are going to receive the Lord. The more you take the Word of God in, and the more you get it into the hands of people, it does its work and you talk to them about the Lord, people will be saved. And then there's going to be a need for baptism. Now, I know you have your own baptistry, which a lot of church planters would salivate over, um, because I know some in the north right now that have to wait till the spring to baptize, because, you know, they do it in the river. And unless you want to be frozen, you don't want to do it in the winter. And, or you might want to use a different church or so on. Uh, but a lot of guys don't have that, and they, don't, they have to wait. So baptism, obviously, takes place in water. We know that. It's immersion. The word baptizo, immerse. Uh, But really, uh, speaking here, baptism takes place in the midst of believers, in the midst of the church. It's an ordinance to the church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper is an ordinance for the church to carry out. So therefore... When, they are, when the early disciples and the church is to go into a new area to bring the Word of God and teach people in a new area about Christ and people receive the Lord, they need to be baptized and baptism takes place in the midst of the local church, right? So the mandate that he's giving here, the commission that he's given here, isn't just to take the gospel into all the world. It's to take the gospel with a purpose. And the purpose is to see local uh, bodies of believers formulating local churches starting so that they can baptize, right? They can baptize. And then also in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, that's continuing to teach the doctrines and teachings of the of Christ and so that's discipleship Uh, that's follow-up that's mentoring that's uh, that's making sure that you don't just leave them there in that area even though they're saved you don't just leave them there no no they need a place to go to where they can be baptized where they can be taught the word of God where they can be trained 
to go out and reach more people, and the whole thing can be perpetuated. It can be uh, churches, birthing churches, that will birth churches. Uh, a few years ago, I was invited to go to Ghana, West Africa. I didn't go. Um, I just couldn't go. But it was an evangelist who said, Brother Roland, every year I go to uh, the West Africa. We put up a big tent. He said, thousands of people come, and hundreds of people get saved. And it's a wonderful, wonderful evangelistic outreach in Ghana. And I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, but where do those people get baptized? And he said, well, he said, well, it's our prayer that when we leave that, you know, a church gets formed. And I said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we go to Ghana, set up a big tent, thousands of people come, hundreds of people get saved for the purpose of starting a local church. Why don't we go in with a plan to organize and we're not going to leave until a church is started. And it just dawned on him, that would be a great thing to do. <laughs> it's almost like it's biblical. <laughs> but listen, this is where uh, evangelical Christianity, okay, not just Baptist, Christianity in the last 30 years has not done a good job with making sure that local churches are organized and started. We've heard a lot about evangelism. We've heard a lot about, you know, uh, uh, and we supported radio ministries, and, and I believe in that. I mean, I, where, where they, they can get, they can broadcast good Christian uh, music and, and preaching and teaching into countries that are not open to the gospel. And I'm all for that. I'm all for getting the gospel out on the World Wide Web. And I'm all for, if it can be on TV and done right, I, I want it to, any way we can, radio, uh, any type of distribution, uh, I want the gospel, I want God's word getting out. But let's not end there. Let's do what Christ said, and let's follow up with starting local churches. And we're going to see by the end of tonight, you'll see that in the New Testament, that's exactly what Paul and the early Christians did. They, did, they went into areas, and without leaving, they would make sure that they were local churches started. Did they have their own building? No. Did they have a lot of finances? No. A lot of them were in poverty. And some of them were in areas where they were stricken, where they were uh, suffering for becoming Christians. But it wasn't the early apostles and disciples' only ambition to just get the gospel into those areas. They knew that they needed to confirm those people and, and disciple those people and so on. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there, but we'll see that in, in a, uh, it today. So here, this, this whole idea that Jesus is teaching the early disciples and, and the formation of the church here is simply that you are to go to all of the world, all nations, teach all of those nations the Word of God, and uh, make sure before we pull out that there are churches started, and those churches are propagating and they're reproducing more churches. And we can see that scripture. So let's go to Acts then, in Acts chapter 1. Remember that word power, because I want you to see something here in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. Here there's the early church in the upper room, about 120 people. Uh, they're assembling together in verse number 4 of the book of Acts. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Now stop right there for a moment. I thought Jesus told them earlier to go to all nations, right? But here he tells the uh, early church, he says, uh, they're assembled together. He says uh, that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Well, that's kind of contradicting what he said earlier. And it would if we didn't read the rest of this context. Because it says, But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Look at verse number 8. But ye shall receive, there's that word power again, right? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So, 
here in this passage, we have to realize this, and this is so important, that this early church, even though they were told to go to all the world, to every nation, he told them, don't even attempt to evangelize and start churches unless you have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't even try it. Don't leave Jerusalem. Don't leave this upper room. Don't even do this until you have that power. Now, I don't want, I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable about this. I think uh, some people have taken the Holy Ghost and have elevated the Holy Ghost above Christ and, and our Father, right? But the Trinity, they're all equal, right? They're all three part of God. So we're not trying to elevate the Holy Spirit here, but the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is so important with us trying to accomplish what Jesus told us to do in reaching all the world. So it says here in verse 8, Ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now we know now, because of the rest of the New Testament, that the moment you are saved, the moment you receive Christ, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. You, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 8, chapter 9, If you have not the Spirit of God, you are not of Him. You are not a child of God if you don't have the Spirit of God. And so they were learning this, and obviously Jesus did say this. He said, After I'm gone, I will send another, the Comforter, the Teacher. Okay? And that's the Holy Spirit. So we have the privilege now in the church age of, of our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Now we have an option every day then. And that option is we have a decision. And that is whether we're going to be filled and empowered with the Spirit of God or we're going to suppress the Word of God by living in the flesh and not let the Holy Spirit of God work through us. So we have that decision, and that's a whole other teaching and so on. But so what Christ is saying here is this. Don't do this in the flesh. Don't, no matter, even, and he's talking here to the early church, but he's talking also his, to his disciples, right? And his disciples lived with him, traveled with him for over three years. You would think if there was ever a group of people that could do it, in the flesh even, it would be the early church and specifically the early disciples and, and, and apostles here. But you know, he said, don't even attempt it. No matter what I taught you, no matter what you saw, you can't do this in the flesh. It is, it is impossible to do in the flesh. You have to do it. It has to be a movement of God. It has to be done in the Spirit of God. It has to be done with the Word of God. Make sure that you do this in the Spirit. So what does he say to do? Verse 8, he said... You shall receive power, the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and ye shall be then witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So here he's uh, methodically, you know, systematically teaching them that you're going to be witnesses. You're going to see churches started. If, you, if you're in the Spirit of God, if you let God's Spirit work through you, you will see people come to know the Lord. You will see uh, new areas like Judea, 30 miles away. And you're, if you go to Judea and you are in the Spirit of God and you're witnessing there and you're giving out God's Word there and the Gospel, you will see people come to know the Lord. And remember what I told you in the book of Matthew, or we know it to be the book of Matthew. Make sure that you, when you see them saved, make sure that you stay and you make sure that people are baptized and discipled and leadership is in place so that that uh, church can function and go on to reach other areas. Then he said to go to Samaria. Samaria was a cross-cultural area. It's a, it's a place that the Jews, it's interesting when you look at how they travel like up to Antioch during this time, they would completely go across the river, go around Samaria, you know, to get up to Antioch. And Jesus is saying, go to Samaria. We're helping a church start in downtown Dayton, Ohio in a few months. And Pete Davidson was born there and raised there. And, uh, but it's, a, it's the most overdosed city in America. It is high crime. Uh, you know, I, I've been in a lot of different areas, of course. 
And I personally would have a hard time driving there in, in where he is going with my wife any day, any, any time of day. It's a very, very difficult area, yet Pete feels led to go there, and there's a lot of churches getting involved with this. It's going to be a wonderful thing. But some people, if you were to drive through Dayton on the interstate, you would basically do just that. You would drive over some of those areas. They've built the interstate, you know, and you may even look over and say, boy, that's a dirty, filthy part of, you know, town, and may never, ever stop, may never... Well, that's the way Samaria is. People would go around it, but they wouldn't go through it. They wouldn't go to it. Jesus is saying here, go to it. And then he says, the uttermost part of the earth. So all of the known world at that time, all of Asia and Minor and, 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 and Italy and, and, and the early parts of Europe, there, you, you go through all of these areas, go to every area and do what you have seen done and what you need to perpetuate. So if we stop for a minute here and think, The early church, they didn't have their own building. They didn't have a lot of money. You think of the disciples that that followed Jesus. He made sure they were fed and all that. But what about now? He's taken out of the world now. Now they don't have their fishermen jobs. Now they don't. Matthew isn't collecting taxes now. He is, you know, they've been following Jesus for three years now. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have all the conveniences that we have now. Uh, what about Peter and his family? We know that at least he was married because, you know, later on his uh, mother-in-law, you know, needs healing and so on. So, you know, they didn't have a lot. Sounds like, you know, First State Baptist Church has more than they had. Right? I mean, here we have a, uh, we have a group of people this morning and most of you have jobs or are on retirement or some type of You have some type of means. You have a building to meet in. You have a beautiful facility. I mean, I'm a little bit jealous because we had to tear down and set up the first seven years of my church plant years ago in in a gym. And sometimes we had to tear down in between services on Sunday because they used a gym sometimes on Sunday. And it was a big, I mean, it was was taxing physically. You have a very, I mean, you don't have to tear down anything here. I mean, you got your own baptistry. I mean... I mean, you've got uh, everything in place. And lights are good. Uh, I have, uh, I, I mean, when we met in that gym, I mean, I couldn't see. I, I, I mean, it was, it was terrible. The sound, I would preach and it would bounce off the walls. And I had to learn to project just right, you know. And, and it was just, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was inconvenient and all of that. Uh, but you have already, within almost two years, more than these early disciples had. Yet he's telling them to go reach the world. Little or no income, no security, no retirement. Where are they going to eat? How are they gonna, I mean, where are they going to sleep? How, all these things. Um, and they're supposed to go even to Samaria? An area where they're, they're probably going to get teased and taunted for going there? Don't you know Jews aren't supposed to go there? Why are you guys going there? I mean, they're going to get persecuted. He's already ta- taught them all of this. But now here it comes. Now they have to act on it. All right? So let's look at Acts chapter 2. And we just a couple more chapters here in the book of Acts for Sunday school. In Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter preaches. Uh, we know this is the day of Pentecost. And uh, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fills Peter. We know what he preached because look at verse 16. It says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter is doing what Christ said, preach the word of God. He's preaching from the book of Joel, at least we know that here from the Old Testament. Uh, He's got the power of, of, uh, of the Holy Spirit upon his life. And then what happens in verse 41 is, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. That's just what they said to do, right? Make sure that they're baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and so on here. What was happening? Well, Peter got up and he preached, and people got saved, and they were baptized, and they were added to this church. Again, we don't know where they're meeting right now. In fact... um, my son Ryan will give you a $100 bill today if before the end of the day when we leave 
you find a church building in the New Testament, or Old Testament, you won't find it there either, uh, you won't find it. You'll find where they met together, maybe in a uh, in the synagogue, or you know, they met together here or there. But we don't really ever see them having their own building where they could call their own. Uh, you don't see them uh, where they even had that type of focus. And so, uh, in America right now, and especially in the last 20 years, we've had this idea uh, that the church is a building. And I went through this when I started the church. We met in a gym and so on, and we eventually got property, and there was a little, uh, there, was a, there was a building on it, but we had to kind of build it out and renovate it. The parking lot's still being done to this day. Uh, it's just a t- long, drawn-out thing. And it's, uh, but but there, it's hard when, you, when, when, you, when you're trying to build a church these days because a lot of people say, well, when are we getting our own building? When are we getting our own building? When, you know, I saw some property pastor, and, and, I, and, I, and church planners are this way. I'm this, I'm this way. I'm always looking for property and something, you know, to build a church building on. And when I pass an old building, that I could say, well, that could be a church. That could be a church. And we have this uh, materialistic view of the church. It even goes in deeper. A church has to have not its own building, but it has to have certain ministries before it's, you know, an official church. Well, where did we get this idea? We didn't get it from Scripture. Maybe it is that we haven't reached the 4,000 different people groups in the world because our focus has been in the wrong place. Our focus has been on the materialistic side, not on the spiritual side. And we spent all these years and time trying to build buildings and putting money here and there. And by the way, I believe in organization. Paul said do things decently and in order, and I believe in all of that. And I'm not against that. Don't, don't get me wrong here. But sometimes we can organize the Holy Spirit right out of the church to where the emphasis isn't anymore on the Spirit of God and what God's want to do. It's on what we want to do. And so here in the New Testament, boy, they're growing. I mean, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, historically, this Jerusalem was about 3,000 or more, or excuse me, 30, uh, 300,000 or more people. So how many people were reached? We don't know. We know if you go with me to uh, chapter 4 and verse number uh, 4, the Bible says, uh, and the number of the men was about 5,000 uh, that, that believed and were added. So we don't know uh, how many people were here, but the emphasis here was on Uh, people were getting saved, they were getting baptized, they were getting discipled. Now we come to an interesting part of the early church because the church is growing at Jerusalem. People were coming from all over the area to come to Pentecost. So you're not only growing with uh, Jews here, you're growing with people that have different languages, different, different dialects, different backgrounds. And a lot of them stayed and joined this church. But God never intended to be one church, right? Um, For instance, Wilmington. How many people are in Wilmington? Reachable people? The city, 78,000, which is counted as half a million people. Okay, so half, just say, well, uh, just say it had half a million, so 500,000 people that are, you know, reachable. If you had one church, like in the day at Jerusalem here, and, and you were trying to reach all those people uh, back then without cars, without public transportation. It would be difficult to get them all to come to one central location, right? Uh, but even if you did that, and even if the church grew to a certain size, if that church died, then how many churches would there be? None. God knew this. God never intended for one church to reach a whole area. And by the way, it's uh, statistically proven that uh, churches can only reach about ten to 15,000 people effectively. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for a church to, uh, to grow to 1,000 people even, and, and for one pastor to effectively pastor those people. Uh, a good balance, would, 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 and this is just, you know, humanly speaking, you can really take care of, a pastor can really only take care of about 100, maybe 150 people before he really needs a lot of help to do that. I'm not saying that it's sinful to have 1,000 people. I'm just saying it's wrong to think that one church 
can handle a half a million people. It's not, it's not, it, it's not even feasible. It's not even practical. It's, it's, it's not. Uh, we were helping a church start in San Jose uh, several years ago. And uh, 1.4 million people in the city of San Jose, in the city limits. And there was one church already there, and that church was reproducing another church. And so we were helping that pastor do that. And there were some other pastors in the Bay Area that were getting involved. One of them, though, uh, was a very, very large church, an in, in independent Baptist. And they had a bunch of buses that they would bus, you know, and pick people up. And they actually, the pastor actually said, what are you starting another church in San Jose for? We run buses in there, and, and we have it covered. Now think about that for a minute. 1.4 million people. And we have, you know, how many buses, 10 buses, and we've got it covered. I, I, I like statistics. I went to the, uh, the web and I counted up how many McDonald's are in San Jose. There are 34 McDonald's, okay? Now San Jose is not big, but it's got a lot of people. There were 32 Walgreens in San Jose. There were 64 Starbucks in San Jose. Now, if Walmart, well, excuse me, if, if McDonald's and Walgreens, and I stopped with Starbucks. Once I hit Starbucks, I said, well, that's fine. Good. But if they thought that they, they only needed one to reach all of San Jose, they would stop with one. But McDonald's said, no, we need at least 34. Uh, you know, Walgreens said, we need at least 32. It's, it's kind of ironic that even the business world knows that they need so many, you know, to reach a population. And they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to investigate and do all the analytics of it and to figure out that they can reach a certain area. But sometimes... Remember I said God gave us a Bible and a brain, right? And he does expect us to use both, and we, be, we will be accountable. For someone to say, well, we've got a 1.4 million area covered with one church, it's not even practical. It can't be done. So this early church at Jerusalem, it was growing and growing and growing, but they weren't going they weren't going to Judea, they weren't, which is only about 30 miles over. They weren't going to uh, Samaria, definitely. And they definitely weren't going to the uttermost part of the earth. In fact, if you, if you put Jerusalem church in today's atmosphere uh, and you ask the, the leadership there, why aren't you reaching Judea or Samaria? They might say, and I'm not putting words in their mouth, okay? Because they had their hands full. They were growing, all right? But maybe they would have said... Well, we're running buses to Judea. We're running buses to Samaria. Or maybe once a year we go over there and we, evan we, we, we put a track on everyone's door in Judea. So we have it covered. That was never God's plan. That was never God's intention to just make sure we put something on everybody's door. He wants, God wants local churches to reach local areas. So let's go through the, the book of Acts here very quickly. Chapter 4, we don't see any mention of Judea, Samaria, or the uttermost. Chapter 5, we don't. Chapter 6, we don't. Chapter 6 is interesting because the church had some infighting. You know, the, the, uh, the, that's why they, they had to uh, prepare with certain leadership, servants, and deacons here because uh, they had some issues from within. Uh, chapter 7, we don't see any any. Uh, any uh, mention of anywhere else but J Jerusalem until we get to chapter 8. In chapter 8, and we'll end with this, the Bible says that the first martyr saw, uh, excuse me, the first martyr Stephen died in chapter 8, verse number 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. That's the death of the first martyr. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Now, God allowed or sent, or however you want to say it, but persecution came to this church. And the persecution that came caused them, forced them to scatter. 
A lot of these people went back to their homeland. Remember, they traveled there for the day of Pentecost. Now they're, uh, now they're going back uh, to their homeland. Others just ran for their life under the persecution. But the Bible, is, it's almost like God wrote the Bible. I hope you're awake because you, you understand He did. All right, Because look at what the Bible says. There was a persecution against the church which is at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of where? Judea and where? Samaria, except the apostles. And then look at verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So here we see the early church, and they were scattered, and uh, they, they were scattered. There's other areas besides Judea and Samaria. Because if you go through chapters 8 and 9, you can circle little areas. I mean, later on in chapter 9, Paul's traveling, or Saul is traveling down to Damascus to kill the Christians there. So there's another area, you know, there's, there, there are all these little pockets of Christians that were being, uh, being discipled or they've been evangelized and now they need leadership and so on. So there's little churches springing up. But the interesting thing here is the Bible says in verse number one of chapter eight, except the apostles. So the church, these people scattered, they were evangelizing, they were seeing people saved. Little churches, nucleuses of people who believed in Christ were starting to spring up. But the apostles didn't do that. So who were the people that were starting these new churches? It was the used guys. It was the usins. I live in Tennessee and there's a difference between you all and y'all. And yins, if you're from Pittsburgh. And I've heard it all, you know, how to pronounce groups of people. But it was the church. The church, under persecution, went out, whether it was deliberate or not, and they spread the word of God to the point where little nucleuses, you know, a few families here and a, and a few families here in this area and a few families in Damascus. and a few. So there were, there were pockets now of little churches springing up. They didn't have pastoral leadership yet. They didn't have... They didn't know everything that they, you know, but it was the people in the church doing that. So, biblically, who is a church planter? It's the church. The the church planter that we know of today, like your pastor, is the one who's been called and trained to pastor those works, see? And we definitely will see that later on. Paul uh, appoints pastors and, and leadership and all that. We'll get to that. But the one thing we have to learn in Sunday school is churches reproduce churches. It's not just saying, uh, oh, you want to plant a church in a uh, you know, nearby area like in New Jersey or whatever, Pennsylvania. Oh, here's $100 a month. We'll pray for you. I've got your prayer card on my refrigerator. We'll pray for you. I hope you make it. That's not what we see in the Word of God. We see the church people evangelizing to the point where new churches need to start. Uh, and I'll finish with this. We, in our church there in uh, north of Nashville, uh, we were out soul winning, just you know, door to door. We led a Sudanese man to the Lord. He told us about how there's a whole bunch of Sudanese people who moved to Nashville. This particular man went through our little Bible institute we have and, and, and was ordained in our ministry. He felt led to you know, preach and all that. And our church appointed him to pastor in the Sudanese population of Nashville. And now there's a church uh, to primarily the Sudanese population there in Nashville, all because uh, our church was out evangelizing. And we led this man to the Lord, and he followed the Lord, and all that. There were some other people traveling about three hours from the the west of our area, and they were traveling to our church because there just wasn't a good church in between. And so, uh, what what our church? There's a few families, so our church went over and started evangelizing that area, and helped get a little meeting place, and put somebody in place to be their pastor, and you know, and then it became a church. And, we're, and that's, that's churches reproducing churches. If, if you live 30 miles from here, and maybe you do, and you evangelize your neighborhood enough, you're going to probably lead some people to the Lord. 
they're probably going to be saved. But they may not be willing to drive 30 miles like you do. In fact, most of them won't. So what do we do? Do we bring them in our cars here? Do we get a little bus and pick up, you know, two or three families? Is, or, and maybe that would work for a time. But eventually, if it's that far away like Judea was, there's probably going to be a need to start a church there. So starting a church somewhere isn't some big, monumental, expensive, you know, big, huge th- task that we just can't do. On the contrary, we can't do it. We have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And if a church just starts praying, not only for their foreign missionaries, but if you start praying for areas around that need churches, let the Spirit of God move. It's not, by, it's not how big the church is. It's not how old it is. It's not how much money you have. That all comes later. The burden has to start sometime. And it needs to really start as soon as the church is started, as it did in the New Testament. These early Christians only knew, we have to evangelize areas. And then those churches only knew. They didn't think our first ministry needs to be a choir. Our first ministry needs to be, you know, Sunday schools. Our first ministry, no, no. Their ministry was evangelizing other areas. That was it. And God used them in a wonderful way. And we're going to see the conclusion of this in a little while.